Good morning, everyone. everyone. Uh, welcome to our service, uh, to those joining us in church and to those joining us online. Uh, just some notices to draw your attention to. A reminder that our loose collection during uh, Lent is towards the Kind Fund. Uh, our choir practice uh, is on Tuesday at half eight. And then Bible study is at quarter to eight uh, on Wednesday in the committee room. And in our family service uh, next Sunday, we'll be looking at See Your King Comes To You uh, on Palm Sunday. And that's 10 to 11 on Facebook and then later on YouTube in the afternoon. If you have any items for the food bank, then if you can bring those along either to the church or to the rectory, and we'll make sure they get to Enniskillen. So let's stand as we have our invitation to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, direct our thoughts, help us to pray, and lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Spirit of God fills the whole world. Come, let us worship. We begin our service by singing, My Hope is Built, and Bless the Lord, O My Soul.
So we come before our God and Father and we confess our sins. Let us pray. And together we say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the colic for the fifth Sunday in Lent, most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we might triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now Ron is going to come and read our reading. A reading from Philippians 3, beginning at verse 4b. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, prosecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is thought through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before the sermon, uh, we sing by faith. Thank you. 
Let's pray. Father, I want to pray that you would take my lips and use them, that you'd speak through them for your name's sake and for your glory. Amen. Well, the passage that Ron read to us is, is such a, a, a passage that's meant to stir us on. As Paul is in, in prison, uh, his first time in prison, he's writing to the church, trying to encourage the church to keep going that despite what they see in the terms of the suffering that he's facing, he wants them to keep going. And I want to look briefly at three points beginning with P. And the first is past. He talks about forgetting what is behind. And so when it comes to the past, we, we see in this passage, he talks about his achievements. And he refers to them, all the different things that people might sort of think, well, those are great, and they earn you a place. He says he counts them as rubbish. And so for us as Christians, whether it be our failures or our achievements, our failures were meant to count as them as being rubbed out. If we've come to Jesus and we've confessed our sins, then those sins are rubbed out. They're dealt with. As far as the east is from the west, we're told so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And if it's to do with our achievements, we're to count those as rubbish. The, the literal word is as dung. We're not to count on those things. And so when it comes to our past, we need to be careful that we don't allow the enemy to, to keep us in the past, either through pride to do with our achievements or to do with guilt and shame to do with the things that we've done in the past. If we've asked for forgiveness, then we need to accept that forgiveness too. We need to recognize that it's nothing that we can do to pay for our sins. It's all been done. And so we need to accept and receive God's forgiveness for the things that we've repented of. The next thing is purpose. And we see here that um, Paul talks about there's one thing he's going to do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He's going to press on. He's straining. It's, it's this theme of being an athlete. He's pursuing what God has taken hold of him for. He realizes that on the road of, to Damascus, when he met Jesus, that there was a call put in his life, and he's going to pursue that like an athlete. don't know if you've uh, heard of um, you, the Roger Bannister, Wes Santi and John Landy. Uh, they were three men who were all trying to, to beat the four-minute mile, the perfect mile. And in this book called The Perfect Mile, uh, the, the author writes about what they had to do. All three runners endured thousands of hours of training to shape their bodies and minds. They ran more miles in a year than many of us walk in a lifetime. They spent a large part of their youth struggling for breath. They trained week after week to, to the point of collapse, all to shave off a second, maybe two, during a mile race. The time it takes to snap one's fingers and re to register the sound. There were sleepless nights, training sessions in rain, sleet, and snow, and scorching heat. There were times when they wanted to go out for a drink or a date, yet they knew they couldn't. They were training for races or gathering the will required for these efforts. They were trying not to think about training and racing at all. What the writer says that these men did was that they had to say a lot of no's to things in order to reach the one huge yes, that perfect mile. It's a picture of the discipline that is required for us as Christians, that Paul is saying here, 
that he is pursuing the thing that God has for his life, pursuing it like an athlete. And he wants those within the church to have that same mindset, that singleness of mindset that what Jesus wants for their life is number one in their life too. If it's not, then the danger is that we're no longer running the race. There's that difficulty that we can, fatigue can set in, because this is talking about, it's not a, it's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon. And fatigue can set in, and there are things that we need to build in our lives in order to prevent that from happening. For those of you who have ever ran long races, uh, then you know that along the race there are pit stops that you can take on what your body needs in order to keep going. And for us as Christians, coming together, having fellowship with one another is one of those things that help to keep us going. It's the pit stop that stops fatigue from setting in. Coming to God every day in our quiet times helps for fatigue not to set in. It reminds us about what it is that we're meant to be about. It helps us keep on the focus of the tip rather than focusing on those around us. Because we know, isn't it, that athletes who do well are those who focus on the tip, not on those who they're running against. They're those who are wanting to cross the line, and that's where their focus is, not on the crowd, on the people around them. And so we need to be those who understand the purpose of God for our lives. That for each one of us, if we're a Christian, then our purpose is that we would grow in Christ's likeness, that he would be number one in our lives, and that the effort that we put in towards that would be more than anything else that we do. That Christ's likeness would come into our workplace, would come into our family, would come into every aspect, because then the kingdom comes through us. That's what we pray, isn't it? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're asking for God's kingdom to come. And the problem is that in our day and age, we don't see the kingdom in the way that God would want, because we don't let God come into our lives in the fullness of the way He wants to, and to influence where we go because of His presence in us. That we need to be like Moses. It was obvious when He was in the presence of God, because when He came down, the people could see it in His face. And where He went, as long as He had the veil off, people could see that He had been in the presence of God. Is that happening with us? Are people aware that our, our, is our life changed by our time with the Lord? If it's not, then there's something wrong, and we need to get back into the race. The last thing is the prize. He talks about that he's running the race. He's got that sense of purpose there's this goal that he's got in his mind. It's the finish tip, the prize for which God has called him heavenwards in Christ Jesus. And I believe that this isn't about him talking about earning salvation. This is he realizes that the prize is being with Jesus. We see this, don't we, when we look through the rest of Philippians, particularly in Philippians chapter 1, where he talks about that he's torn between being in this world and going to the next. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, then this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. That's the prize for him. The prize for him is that one day he will see Jesus face to face, that he will be in the first resurrection, 
the resurrection of the dead of those who love and serve Jesus. He doesn't want to be included in the second one. He wants to be included in the first one, the resurrection of the faithful. And that's why he talks about, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing and of suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to obtain to the resurrection from the dead. It's a mystery to him. We see that in what Paul says later in in some of his letters, he talks about the mystery, and there is a mystery. We don't quite understand how it is that we get to obtain all that Jesus has in store for us, but we know it will happen when we stay to the end. Another story about athletics is a story about the Olympics in 1968 and a Tanzanian marathon runner uh, who, coming into this event, he knew that he was going to be at some loss because of the high altitude that he was running at. But anyway, he competed. He was sent by his country to compete. And sure enough, as the race went on, he found cramp coming into his legs, but he kept going. Then along the way, there was a bit of a tussle with some of the runners, and he fell over. He scraped his knee, dislocated a joint. And at that point, probably if it was us, we would have dropped out. Like the 18 others, 75 started the race, 18 didn't finish. But this guy decided no. He got medical attention, And then he ended up continuing the race. When he finally came in, the last runner to come into the stadium, there was only a couple of thousand people who had stayed to the end to watch him. But they cheered as he hobbled around and came to the finish line and crossed the line. And he was asked by a reporter, why did you not drop out? And he said, well, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. And that's what we need to be like, that we need to be those who don't start it, but finish the race that's set before us. And if we can do that, then we see that this is Paul's letter when he was first in prison, and we see in Second Timothy his last letter. In the last chapter of the last letter that he writes, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In conclusion, we read in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 and 25, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'd help us. Lord, forgive us for those times when, Lord, we stop running. When we look back, when we are tempted to look back on our successes, or, Lord, we're caught up with shame because of our failures. Lord, would you help us that we would look ahead, that we would, Lord, accept the forgiveness that you offer freely when we repent. That, Lord, you'd help us that we would run and pursue you with the same passion that we see that Paul had, that we see in many athletes, that, Lord, we would have that passion for you, that drive to strain towards what is ahead. Lord Jesus, that you'd help us, that we would be those 
who understand the prize that's ahead of us. And that through the hard, difficult times, Lord, we fix our eyes on that, on, on you. That one day we'll see you face to face. Till that time, Lord, would you help us, that we would keep in step with your Spirit, that we would allow your Spirit to be the pacemaker, the one who helps us to run the race well to the finish. We ask this in your name. Amen. We sing one more step along the world I go. standing and we affirm our faith. To believe and trust in God the Father. I believe and trust in God the Father who made the world. To believe and trust in God the Son. I believe and trust in his Son Jesus Christ who redeemed mankind. To believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit. I believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the church worldwide, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all who govern and hold authorities in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that your glory be proclaimed through our lives. Father in heaven, we lift to you Christian women and girls living in contexts of persecution and marginalization, who are often doubly despised because of their faith and gender. 
We pray especially for widows and their children who are more vulnerable without their husband's earthly protection. Father of compassion, please provide for their daily needs and shield them from harm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for, for tomorrow, for those who have lost children and loved ones in this terrible war, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for all those displaced from their homes, both within Ukraine and beyond, that you would provide for their needs that countries around the world would respond with generosity and compassion. We pray particularly for our own country that more would be done to both ease and speed up the process of people finding refuge here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those known to us in need of your touch, and in the silence we bring them to your throne of grace, especially remembering the Moore family. And together we say, stretch out your hand to bring healing to those who are sick, comfort for those who mourn, and hope to those in despair. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing, Fight the Good Fight. Before our closing prayers, uh, just a reminder that there is tea and coffee at the back of the church, and we're just going to pray for that and for our fellowship that continues. And so, Father, we thank you for all the good things that you give us. We pray you'd bless 
uh, what we're going to eat and drink and continue to bless our fellowship together. We ask this in your name. Amen. And so we have our closing prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you emptied yourself, taking the form of a servant. Through your love, make us servants of one another. Lord Jesus Christ, for our sake, you became poor. May our lives and gifts enrich the life of your world. And we say together, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. We turn to one another and we say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So every blessing, uh, Lorna and Beatrice are going to play us out.